It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. I'm Dennis Farrell. That's Lars Fredrickson. Lars, I've missed you, bud. Missed you too, pal. We've had a great little run. I mean, it's the new year. You know, we've had our first guest, Levi Shapiro, which I thought was great. I mean, you know, for us, concentrating on the indie guys is also part of, you know, the wrestling perspective. Because I always feel like, you know, you get some of these guys, they have a totally, completely different outlook. You know, and I think that's good for the show. And I think it's just good for wrestling. I will say today we're going to have a lot more viewers than normal because we've got Josh Alexander. But go back and listen to some of these interviews we have with indie guys and listen to their struggles and and what they have to figure out. Because just because you don't know them or you may never know them doesn't mean they don't have an interesting story. Right. Exactly. And I think the part of the wrestling perspective podcast and i think the thing that we me and you always want to bring is that human you know the humanity of it all because as as performers and as people who live on the road basically and you know these guys take bumps and are very physical um you know just to hear different sort of different sides different um mindsets around it is always pretty interesting to me regardless if the guy's a superstar or not you know a worker is a worker that leads into our first question unless you have anything else no. Well, our first question. Oh, wait. Actually, yes. I do. As a matter of fact, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, potential news, and we've been talking a little bit about it. Um, there's a great chance by the end of January, you will be able to also listen to us on Sirius XM on, on the uh, Fight Nation channel. So more details to come. We're still kind of working it all out, but that's our big announcement. Yeah. Um, We're really you know, excited. I'm we, I'm super excited about it. We don't want to bang the drum, go on too much about it. As the deal closes, we'll talk more about it. But let's get into the fan emails so we don't – For sure. Oh, we got tons of them. Uh, Matt Mann, the sign guy, he even put his little website, when it was cool.com, once has a Lars only question. What oh. are your top five wrestlers do you feel made the biggest impact in Nor- North Cal indie scene in 2022? And who is your big breakout North Cal indie wrestling star in 2023? Titus Alexander. Titus Alexander, 100%. Um, He's the best, bar none. He should already have a contract. I'm surprised that he doesn't. This kid is is, is he's he's money. He's it, it, just start printing the paper because this kid's got everything. His dad uh, was also a professional wrestler that I used to go and see. And uh, Josh Alexander, big, what? Josh Alexander? Is no, uh, the big ugly, um, big ugly, but. Uh, yeah, no, Titus Alexander. Um, and let me think who the, the ah, NorCal. Hmm. I mean, there's so many great wrestlers. I mean, um, but I, you know, whether they're not from Northern California or not, I'm not too sure because I would think of Juicy, but I think he's a SoCal guy. Um, independent scene is pretty ripe up in the Bay Area and Northern California. And we get a lot of guys from a lot of different promotions. We get some Buffalo guys. Um, but yeah, I would I would say Titus is probably my, my hands down. This kid's a superstar. He's got a great attitude, you know, from what I can tell. He's a great heel. Um, and he's just money. He's just money. Well, uh, Alex from Ontario, we got to move it on real quick. Wants to know, Lars? Uh, we all know about your relationship with CM Punk, and I try not to ever ask you CM Punk questions because we get a ton of them. But he goes, can you tell us when and how CM Punk got his love for wrestling back? I figured that's a good question to ask because there's so many of the ones we get that never will make it to air. So stop asking about brawls. <laughs> um, you know, I think he 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 has – that's part of the the thing with him. I don't think that love of wrestling ever left him. I think – Part of the reason why maybe he left the first time around is because of that love of wrestling, you know, because he's so, you know, I, I think of, of certain guys that have come along, him being one of them, who have this passion for this business, the, the aesthetic of it, the way that they feel like it should be done and how to accomplish that. Um, and I feel like, you know, it's not really a hatred or a, a losing of love. It's more of a, 
you love it so much. You, 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 I mean, you know, we, I mean, as we've seen the, the guy's a lifer and we're probably, this is not the last we've ever, we are going to see of him. You know, I don't think anyways. Well, as a guy who was on Zoom with him once, uh, I will say, um, uh, from an outside look, and then he just seems like one of those guys that put so much into it. You need to step back to reappreciate it when you come back. And I don't know if he meant it to be seven plus years, but you know what? He's back, and we got to enjoy it because we shit on John Cena for so long, and now that he's gone, we all kind of miss him. I don't, but um, <laughs> I, I never. Re- I mean, even though he's a class act. Uh, he's, you know, probably, you know, even a greater human being. I mean, that guy has done a lot for, for the fans and everything else, but I never enjoyed any one of his matches unless it was with people that I wanted to beat him and he lost to them. Um, I literally hated the gimmick. I I thought it was, it just did not resonate with me. That's not my, I, I, I couldn't relate. I'm just not. I, I so bye. I'm thankful you're gone. Um, you're better in the TV show that you're in. You're more enjoyable to watch. Well, clear cut from Lars Fredrickson. Um, but I mean, I'm not, that's not. I'm not. You know, taking we all have down. those guys. We all have yeah. those wrestlers that we just don't get, and and it's okay. But like I said, and I'll always give him credit. He was the first, one of the very first. I uh, Rancid Radio did his very first ever ever interview uh when he was still the prototype when he was in southern california uh for not was it hollywood or is it california championship wrestling i would have uh, brian for toronto wants to know uh i just got done watching wrestle kingdom i have a two-part question can any company other than wwe put on an event that large and b why does it seem like kenny omega is just different when he's over in japan opposed to america that is a great question. Um, I think Kenny Omega made his bones over there. I think people started talking about him over here because of what he was doing over there. Um, I think he's a definitely he's got that psychology, you know, that the Japanese fan really loves. Now, which if is you're totally different from the American fan. One hundred percent. I I don't necessarily know if that same impact has been made in America, although he is a name and you know, uh, for what he is in, in, you know, North America. But I, I always, you know, when I saw him over at Wrestle in Japan, um, you kind of understand why he, he's, he's, cause he's kind of like an anime character. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, absolutely. you know, I feel like, you know, he's definitely, you know, he, I just feel like he, he appeals more to that audience than he, than he, I can't, you know, but. Yeah, you know, it's not another slag. I just think that's just my opinion. It's like Coke and Pepsi. You, you, you can't put. Well, no, Pepsi is definitely the superior product. Let's just stop. There. Right. It, but you can't give a Pepsi to a Coke guy and expect him to enjoy it. And I think that's the, you know, as much as Kenny Omega has broken the code, how to get over with Japanese uh, fans. I don't, I don't buy into him. I don't hate him. I just don't buy into him here in America. I enjoy some of the things that he does, um, but I also feel like in Japan, I feel like he's 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 got a little bit more of the psychology in his wrestling. I think when he gets, you know, to North America and just the the company that he's in with AEW, and it's a little bit more Wild West indie style kind of outlaw kind of thing. I don't. I just. I just feel like he's he's better suited with with sort of more of a game plan that, I mean, that I, I'm just hypothetically speaking, of course, but um, I don't know if there's more of a game plan over there than there is here. I don't know. I don't know the inner workings, but I feel like when you're working for new Japan pro wrestling, which is a very, very um, professional outfit, I feel like you got to kind of bring your a game, which I think he does. And maybe, maybe that's the difference. Maybe he has to turn it on differently over there than he does here. And uh, is there a company that can put on that size of an event other than WWE? And while you think about it, I think it will take a multi-company event to put something on here in America for that. And I don't even know if there's really a stadium big enough to give it that, uh, was it, the Tokyo Dome kind of feel that that has. Uh, maybe Dallas. 
outside of that, I'm not I'm not sure there's a stadium that can give it that feel because you're not gonna go into like one of the smaller arenas that that some of these wrestling events go into and put on a show that kind of size, you know. You, you... Yeah, I, I mean I think you're right. I think you would have to partner um with a few other companies um to make something like that happen. And I would love to see that. You know, I feel like, you know, the biggest missed opportunity for when they broke down the the uh, fourth wall or whatever is they could have done a Crockett Cup. They could have done, um, you know, they could have done so many things here when they were working with so many different promotions. And, you know, I don't really see it that it's happening so much. I feel like a lot of the American companies are working more with the Japanese companies. For instance, Carl Anderson, WWE, working for New Japan, AEW, AAA, you know, uh, with FTR in New Japan. Um, so I I feel like Jap uh, the Japanese wrestling, I mean, they've done those super shows before um, and had different promotions involved. So I feel like that's how you pull it off. Uh, let's get to one last question, and if we didn't get to your question this week, uh, trust us, it will go to the top of the list for next week's podcast, we promise. Uh, Sam from St. Louis, what was the last wrestling match you've watched on TV? Well, it was last night I watched, um, would have been, well, but so it would have been Dynamite of, you know, where obviously we debut on or, you know, publish on a Sunday, so um that that would be the last one that I've watched, uh, which was the 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 main event, which was Brian Danielson. No, it wasn't. It was uh, Darby Allen and Samoa Joe, which I wanted to talk about because that match, I thoroughly enjoyed that match. Um, I thought it was probably one of the better things I've seen on AEW TV in a while, and it's probably because I'm so invested in Darby and so invested in Joe. Um, as wrestlers, there's there was really a shit for story, but then again, it's AEW, so it's kind of there's a lot of things that are just I feel like just thrown out there and put together last minute. But uh, it's like an indie show in in that sense. Um, but uh, I really enjoyed that, and I really enjoyed the banter between uh, MJF and Brian Danielson. Uh, for me, Daniel Bryan, or... that he's the same guy from what I'm told. Merrick uh... the Dragon. We'll just call him the Dragon. Uh, for me, it was Sasha Banks at Wrestle Kingdom. I saw her show up, or Monet, as she's being called, which is clever, by the way. I actually like it now she's being called the CEO. I was highly uh, interested to see how that would come off. It came off splendid. Uh, you know, uh, the, the problem with a lot of these WWE, and I think I can call her WWE-made superstar is. Yeah, for sure. To other promotions, they just can't quite you know get over uh for me braun Strowman was the other kind of guy like that where i i don't think it mattered where braun went braun wasn't going to get over with with any fans outside of wwe but i mean that's another thing about that guy's question about omega in japan look who he was in the ring with over there mm -hmm. all right things are about to get golden are you ready yeah i'm ready all right uh when we come back we're going to bring you a little bit of uh, Josh Alexander. Hang on. All right. We are back with the longest reigning world champion for Impact Wrestling, the longest reigning tag team champion as well, uh, The Face. That's the best way to put it. And you know what, guys? I got a special surprise for you both. I've been, I've been keeping this from you, Lars. Josh is not the only champion we have on this podcast today. What? One of us won our fantasy football league. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thought from champion to champion, we can connect <laughs> your first three timer. I know that uh, you're not a fantasy football champion, but uh, welcome. Greatness respects greatness, my friend. <laughs> well, I, I'm humbled to be in your presence, you know, with that, <laughs> that lovely championship you have on your shoulder. How does it feel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> goes out to everybody okay. now that bit's Congrats. over let's move on uh, yeah congratulations dennis thank you thank well, you everybody. i mean we break we, we got fucking josh alexander here and you're trying to outshine the guy i know, you know i mean canadians are very sensitive okay? he has no, it, it's snowing up there there's no grass on the ground you keep trying you know you've kept him waiting 
And now you do this, Dennis. Well, he's the first three-time wrestling perspective yeah. guest. I mean, that's probably dwarfs all your other accomplishments. So uh, <laughs> congrats. Uh, listen, I'm going to start the question off. And I, I'm i a big fan of yours. You are family to me now. We I've met you many times at Impact following P.D. Williams around. Rest in peace. Um, so my question to you here is being following your career, knowing where you were when you came in and, and with the North – uh, Ethan Page leaves, kind of propels you in the singles competition. If Ethan stayed with Impact, would you be a world champion today? Probably not. No, I, I wouldn't imagine we would. I, I think that North run would have continued to go for at least, you know, a year, year and a half before we kind of split up and did, because like eventually everything runs its course. You know, I know there's like FTR and the Young Bucks and these tag teams that stay together forever, but then you looked at me and him and it, we were both individuals that came together and we made a great tag team because we had chemistry and all this other stuff. But, uh, you know, I think at, at some point that would have come to an end, but I don't think it would have materialized fast enough for me to be a world champion sitting here right now. Well, you know, I mean, over, over the course of time, we've seen you sort of progress as a singles wrestler and now you're the world champion and you got a big test with bully ray coming up here pretty soon in a week or so um kill friday the 13th i mean you know here we're, we're talking about you know a guy who's disrespected you in a massive way how do you prepare for a guy like him who's obviously a seasoned veteran and you know what, what are you doing to prepare yourself to take him on 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 the 13th well, like, as far as being a seasoned veteran, all this stuff, like, uh, you know, I, I've been down this road before, you know, I, I won that championship initially with the shortest title reign in impact history. The first time I went to the history books when I defeated Christian cage. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I've since, you know, uh, re redeemed myself from that now as longest reigning champion, I guess. But, uh, you know, getting in the ring with people like Kaz who have like 25 years experience and all these other people, like I've been in there with seasoned vets before I myself, you know, I'm in my 18th year in this business and I'm not saying I know everything by any stretch, but, uh, you know, that's not, that's not the X factor that I think, you know, puts me at, you know, a disservice going to this match. It's, you know, my, maybe my emotions, as we've talked about in the past year here at impact kind of get the best of me every once in a while. And they've certainly gotten the best of me lately with everything Bully Ray's done. That's, you know, by design, by everything he's done. And I, I, I demanded full metal mayhem for this because, you know, I am so pissed off and I, I want to make a statement against Bully Ray, but you know, that, that is the stuff that he has made his career on. That's the stuff he is known for. And I'm, I'm known as the wrestlers wrestler, the wrestling machine, whatever else. And I, I've never had a match like this in my entire career. I don't think anybody has any footage or seen any thing of me doing anything like this before. So I'm going into uncharted territory for myself here at hard to kill and uh, you know, the preparation for it is no different than any other match. It's just, uh, you know, I know I'm going to have to endure a whole lot more pain than I usually would. And uh, I, I think, you know, if there's one thing I can say about me in Impact Wrestling, it's that my heart has carried me through a lot of tough matches uh, to get me to this point right now. And I think at Hard to Kill, it's going to have to do the same thing. And I have the extra motivation of, you know, wanting to embarrass Bully Ray at his own game because of everything he's done, you know, not just to me, but to Tommy and my wife and everything else. This is kind of a happy accident, but uh, last week, Lars and I were talking about fond memories of center stage. You know, I kind of grew up in the Atlanta as an Atlanta wrestling fan, a WCW guy. I used to go with my Boy Scout troops to center stage to watch wrestling events. And you are a, a wrestling nerd, kind of like we are. Do, do you geek out going into these arenas? Do you stop? How do you like? I guess my question is, is wrestling at a center stage, which is kind of a, a low end of iconic, but it's still an iconic arena. You know, you have Philadelphia, you have these other places. Do you do you feel like an extra charge as Josh Alexander, the wrestling fan, when you go into these buildings? Or is it slab of concrete and you just go in and every ring's the same? No, no, you definitely like, at least for me, you know, maybe this is the wrestling nerd portion of me, but you, you definitely feel a little bit more going into venues like, you know, like the ECW arena. I've wrestled in Maple Leaf Gardens. I've been lucky enough to wrestle in Madison Square Gardens and stuff like that. So you go into these venues where so much history has been made in the past. And I remember when I went to center stage, I, I believe the first time was earlier this year when I uh, defended my championship against Joe Doring. And, you know, you look around and you're just like, man, like, 
the amount of names and you know successful legends and icons in our business that have been in that building and made history in that building for the like the wrestling game you know it just adds the stakes of you know you going in there and wanting to make your own mark now Barge was in there you know, by the way what's that you were in center sage he left you off that I, list of the greats that have been in there this is my bad you know, I'm, yeah. hey but uh go bully ray no but no um <laughs> The, now I lost my train of thought. What I was going to ask you is, okay, so we saw the forbidden door get opened, and I don't, you know, I'm not necessarily sure what's happening with with Impact and AEW if they're, you know, if, if there's still a, a a decent working relationship. But I always felt that that I saw more of the AEW guys on Impact TV um, than I did vice versa. So was that hard, you know, in in a way for you? You know, being sort of a leader of the locker, uh, the locker room out down there or up there or whatever, however you would describe impact. I mean, you know, seeing that, I mean, was it was that difficult in any way? Yeah, yeah. During like the whole, especially during like the Kenny part portion where he was the champion and all this other stuff, you know, it, there was definitely I mean, like a cloud over the locker room, I'd say of, you know, you'd hear whispers and little conversations in the corner being like, man, like it's a, it's the door is swinging one direction right now they're all coming here you know what i mean and th that's fine it elevates our product to have you know new faces and stuff competing with our guys to put us on the same level of course like me defeating christian cage that's like another thing that you know we have to be grateful for obviously and i'm very grateful for that opportunity but uh it would have been real nice if you know some impact wrestlers could have got on to the aw programming and showing what we could do against those guys because i think you know our locker room stacks up you know right up there with any locker room in this business, be it WWE, AEW, New Japan, anything like that. This may not be a fair follow-up question, but uh, when you were coming up to free agency, did that weigh heavy into your decision on whether to stay with Impact or not? Or was that kind of just a non-factor? No, no, that, that part, there was no ill will or anything from my perspective on that. Like during that whole time, like I, I spoke with guys like Kenny and Christian and even Tony Khan himself and he came tapings and I talked to him, you know, and stuff like that. So like, I, I knew they were all like nice people and like they were, they'd be fine to work for and all that other stuff. I just saw impact as a place where I'd have more opportunities to show what I was good at, more opportunities to grow so that I could build my own name, you know, for the next time my contract's up or even the time after that. Bars. That was the thing, you know, I started to think about um, the last time I think that you were on this show, you were just, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dennis, but I think you still had a job and you're kind of figuring out like, oh, now, you know, am I going to quit this job to become a full-time professional wrestler? And here you are now a world champion. Um, you know, obviously a better decision was made. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Like, I, I have to like always mention this because when I always mentioned I was still working in nine to five and stuff, I feel like fans out there, like whoever wants to dog on impact, they're just going to dog on impact. They're just going to see the negatives all the time. So they saw me saying something like that and they'd be like, oh, this guy doesn't get paid enough. Impact sucks or anything like that. And that that was so far from the truth. Like I could have quit my job long before I did. It was just with two kids and a wife and, yeah. you know, all these bills and stuff, you know, you didn't have the security of like, what if I got hurt? and all this right. other stuff so it, i was just waiting around biding my time until you know i could finally jump into the deep end there and really you know bet on myself and you know i finally did it probably i think it was about six months before those contract negotiations started up so at what point did you stop feeling nervous about that decision to quit the real job because uh we just had levi shapiro on uh a week before and he was talking about how he's in that position where he could quit, but he'll struggle, but he doesn't know if it's worth it. And he was scared. You're a guy that bet on himself and ended up hitting gold. But there had to have been a point where even after the contract, there had to have been that nervousness because you didn't have that uh, safety net below you anymore. Was there a moment or a point where you could step back and breathe and go, I made the right fucking decision? Yeah, I, I think the point where that hit for me was bound for glory. So I quit my job about two months before that match with Christian happened, maybe a month and a half. I was there. Yeah, yeah, you were there and uh, in Vegas. And, uh, you know, it was about the time that that whole show was over. And I realized that, you know, I kind of had arrived and, you know, cemented my place as, you know, a top guy, at least in Impact Wrestling, if not the entire wrestling industry. 
where I was just like, you know, I, I think I, uh, I made the right decision and I'm good now. I, I can rest, rest comfortably that I made the right decision. Well, do you, do you foresee yourself with a, a longer term, you know, with impact or is this, you know, cause I mean, I feel like some of these companies like ROH used to be, and I'm not too sure if impact has taken that place or not. I don't, I see it as a major company, but some wrestlers don't. Right. Do you see this as a stepping stone, a place to really hone your craft and then move on to bigger and better things? Or are you kind of like, you know what, I'm here and, you know, the sky's the limit. If anything else happens, whatever. But this is this is kind of like it for me. Um, well, like I grew up as a fan of Impact Wrestling. And I, I, I think like when I grew up and I was really idolizing guys like AJ Styles and Abyss and these mm. these homegrown Impact talents from the very beginning. And I saw them stick with the company through and through throughout the growth and even, you know, some of the downturn of the company, you know, I, I'm, I'm a real loyal guy. Like if everything's good for me, if my family's taken care of, if I'm happy and I'm getting opportunities, that's all that matters to me. Really. I, I, I just do what makes me happy. That's why I've persisted and stuck with wrestling for so long. That's why I was still around 14 years into my career to even get noticed and signed by impact wrestling, because this is the only thing that really makes me happy. It gives me fulfillment. So as long as I can do that and be happy, I'm good, man. But like, I, I can't say I'd ever want to leave. You know, I want this company. I want to be a guy like an Abyss and an AJ Styles in the early years and the building blocks now as we continue to grow. Because I think, you know, since about the time that I started in this company, maybe a year before when the management changed, it, it started a slow growth period. And I think you're seeing like everything come out of that now with guys like Chris Bay and Ace Austin and, you know, people like Jordan Grace and all these other mm -hmm. people that have kind of been the homegrown impact talents, because for so long in these past, you know, probably seven, eight years, impact wrestling has really been a place for people to leave those bigger companies and come back and reinvent themselves and try to go back. And it's been a place for lesser known people to, you know, come in and be discovered so they can go there a la like the Trevor Lees and the killer crosses and stuff like that. So Hopefully, you know, I'm betting on impact and the growth of this company and, you know, hopefully it won't be a problem where I have to leave or anything like that. You know, I, I do have goals. I, I, I've i started setting wrestling goals for the first time in my career as to like maybe a year or two ago. I was just like just happy doing whatever I was doing and getting to wrestle. And now it's like as I achieve these things, such as, you know, being longest reigning world champion and stuff, I'm starting to set bigger and bigger goals for myself. And impact gives me a ton of freedom. I just want to be able to wrestle in Japan. That's like one thing I have to do, especially in the prime of my career. So, you know, I've spoken to them about that and they know that I really want to go. So hopefully we can make that materialize. And if that happens and I can do that and be an impact wrestling and do all this stuff, I'll be happy as a pig and shit, man. Like well, <laughs> I don't no see a reason for me to go anywhere. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Fuck, I can't believe you did that. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, I, you know, we'll get to your goals here in a minute. But uh, at the top of the show, we talked about you being the longest reigning world champion, you being the longest reigning tag team champion. You, in my mind, are a surefire impact Hall of Famer. But in your mind, what do you have to do to to cement you being an impact Hall of Famer? Or do you think you're already there? is the first time that's ever been mentioned to me and the first time I've ever thought about it as of right now. Um, well, you're on. You you got to answer it. You can't. And go. It. Yeah. <laughs> I I think it would be tough to say I'm like a, a surefire Hall of Famer. I've only been in the company for three and a half years right now. And, oh, no. I'm, yeah, three and a half, four years. We're coming up on four years in the spring, sorry. Um, And it's just such a short period of time. And yes, I've had a lot of success here. I, I've won every championship there is to win. And except for the internet championship now that that's around, but, uh, the, or sorry, the digital media championship, but, uh, <sighs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a heavy thought, but, uh, I, I for sure would like to go down to the history books as one of the greatest in impact history. Like I I've said it before that when you think of TNA, you think of AJ Styles right away. And, you know, if, when people think about impact wrestling, even though it is kind of like a, a branch off of TNA itself and it is in the history books with the same synonymous with the same thing but like when people think about impact I want them to think about Josh Alexander when I'm all done this thing and that's why I go out every pay-per-view and try to like steal every show and have these marquee matchups and you know kill myself doing all this stuff because I just want to get noticed and build my brand and build impact at the same time well you know you've you, you've been I think I actually saw you wrestle for New Japan in San Jose if that and um, are you coming again for that another the next show for them or 
I, I don't believe so. I haven't done the strong okay. stuff in a while, but uh, okay, okay, yeah. Well, that was my, an awesome well, show. Yes, but I do see you know you work in a lot of indies, you know, and it's not something necessarily that you. I feel like you would have to do at this point. Um, what is the reasoning behind that? Because I mean, here you are, you're a world champion in a major company, and you're still out there working the indies, and you know. Um, is this to kind of keep the rust off or is this to, to are you still feel, feeling like you're honing your craft or what is the psychology behind you getting out there and doing that kind of stuff? A little, a little bit of both. Um, uh, uh, like I'll say it right now, man, I, I've had uh, several people from management come to me from the very top all the way down to like talent relations and ask me to work less on the Indies. Uh, but the freedoms of my contract allow me to, you know, do that all on my own. So uh, it, it is half the more I wrestle, the sharper I feel. So when I do show up to these impact tapings and these pay-per-views and stuff, I, I I feel more ready. If I have two weeks off, I feel like I forget how to wrestle for some reason, even though that's not the case, but that's how I feel. Um, it's that. And it's also to me, like, uh, I, I just think I have this giant impact bumper sticker on my back and I'm, I'm going around to these indies. And if people can see me wrestle and defend this championship, if they haven't checked out Impact Wrestling after they see me wrestle a main event on an indie against, you know, whatever hometown local guy it is in that town that I'm in, they might tune into Impact Wrestling. They might check us out, and discover not just me, but everybody else we have and how our product is awesome right now and give it a chance. So that that's part. It's a little bit of both. Impact has always been good to me and good to Lars and to, you know, with PD as a, a guy who used to do the podcast and has unfortunately moved on to sadder things uh, up north. We don't like to talk about it. Um, you being a proud Canadian guy, an impact guy, and knowing PD in anything like that, is there – are are there – Thoughts or anything in your heart, and this is kind of a loaded question because I would like to see it, but you're the face of impact. You 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 have this resume behind you now. Do you want to be a leader of like a a stable or or resurrect maybe like a Team Canada stable or anything like that? I know you probably get asked this a ton, but I I could see you being a leader in a stable in, but yet. You know, I, I I personally, as a fan, would like to see that out of you. Do you have thoughts on that kind of stuff? Absolutely. I, I have jokingly and, you know, half seriously made these comments in passing several times where I'm just like, when's Team Canada 2.0 happening? Like, I'm ready for this. I, I think now, especially with our roster with guys like Mike Bailey representing Canada, you know, Taya Valkyrie is Canadian. We have all these Canadians in our company that, you know, Giselle Shaw. Um, I, I think that we're ready to have a Team Canada 2.0. Personally, as a wrestling fan, I was always a fan of stables. I came up when I first discovered wrestling, it was the NWO era, and then it was the DX era. And like, th these were like the two hottest things in pro wrestling for me. And I, I think, you know, that went right into like, even from the Heart Foundation, right to Team Canada, when I discovered Impact Wrestling and TNA. Uh, I was such a fan. So, I, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of people out there like you and me that, you know, are fans of this kind of thing and want to see it. So hopefully it can happen eventually. Uh, I think nostalgia is a great thing with a little twist on it, you know, uh, but, you know, that's out of my hands. Uh, I don't write the show, uh, but I, I've definitely pushed for it. I want to go back a little bit to you and Ethan Page because and I want to understand a little bit behind, you know, obviously Ethan left. And I'm not too sure what broke up the team, if it was just a matter of the two of you guys, maybe just like saying this is it or contracts or whatever, and things couldn't work out. Um, so I, I have a two part question, but the first part of it is what split the team up? Was it the contract or was it just you guys wanted to go do your different ways? I think it was a little bit of both. Uh, his contract was up a year before mine. I, I signed exactly a year after him. We both signed three-year deals and uh, his came up and like it was, he, he was pretty vocal that he wanted to go elsewhere and he ended up going elsewhere, which was fine. But at the same time, we, we had been a tag team for about 10 years. We were successful in the Indies. When we came to Impact, we really took over that entire scene and we found all the success in the world as a tag team. And, you know, like I said, I, I think all good things run their course eventually. We were both two individuals, two separate goals and two separate mindsets on pro wrestling that, you know, began to clash really towards the end there mm. where we weren't really getting along to the point where, you know, the friendship kind of broke away. So 
we went our separate ways and you know he's found all the success in the world he has at AEW I'm sure he's happy and you know I, I'm doing what I'm doing and we're good but you know Once well again, I mean is there oh, sorry I had a two-part question oh that's right I <laughs> forgot I apologize guys uh but um so I mean you know I I have been in situations with bands and stuff where you know not ones that I'm currently in but ones that I used to be in where you know friendships uh, you know, it, there's a, a heavy strain on the friendship, but once it's done and there's a little bit of uh, wind has come and cleared the smoke and all the bullshit out of the way, you know, you kind of can see a little bit more eye to eye. Where are you now with Ethan? Uh, we, we haven't really communicated since he left the company. <laughs> so, uh, oh. you know, it's just been like, I, I saw him at a signing here or there. It's like a, Hey, how you doing? Things are good. Yeah. I hope they're good. Like there's no ill will or anything. It's just, we're, we're in separate sandboxes doing separate things with separate goals. And, uh, you know, that's it. Well, I mean, the biggest, when they started doing the AEW, uh, impact thing was, are they going to bring the North back? And I guess, that might have been some of the reasons why we didn't see it. I mean, I can see Ethan not coming back to Impact because it was a uh, bumpy breakup on on that part. So, and you guys not showing up on TV over there. But was there? And, and we'll get off of the Ethan Page thing. Trust us here in a sec. But it was part of your history that I don't know. I don't feel like you've talked at nauseum about it yet. And we're going to get there with you today. Trust us. Um, but was was there that thought when when the AEW uh, things started to happen? Like, hmm, a little bit of going back to the well on this. Um, I I don't I think other people had the thought. I don't think anybody within management of either company or neither Ethan Page or myself had really the thought that that was ever going to materialize or be a thing. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it. I, I've said it before. Like, I, I think that FTR match would have been cool. But other yeah. than that, I, I think, honestly, I think it ran its course with the tag team and stuff. And, you know, that's it. Yeah. Well, I see you, you know, I, I feel like every decade or so, you get a guy that makes a huge impact, whether it be, you know, Brian Danielson with a certain style or, um, you know, the list goes on, but not very deep. But you're one of those guys where I see that you can get in there and have a match with just about anybody and you can bring the psychology. And one of the questions I always ask, and you're not gonna be any different, but how important for you is the psychology to bring that to the ring? You know, everybody can, you know, bounce off a trampoline and do, you know, bullshit things, go through tables, blah, 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 go over it. I mean, maybe not everybody, I can't, right? So I don't want to. And if you did that to me, I'd fucking shoot you. So, you know, my point is, is like, you know, how do you bring that psychology still into that match and tell that story? Because I feel like that's kind of becoming a little bit more of a lost art these days. I think it's the most important thing. Uh, like like you you mentioned Brian Danielson it, it, kind of in passing when you were talking about it. Like, I think the thing that sets the Brian Danielsons apart from anybody else is that he brings that psychology every time. And I try to apply a sense of realism to everything I'm doing. So like that's that's basically the the psychology of my pro wrestling match every time. Like the moves are great, but like I could care less if we use all of them, or do some of them, it doesn't matter. I I think they're all they're all tools in your tool belt, tool belt to use if they do apply to making the match as real and immersive as possible for the fan watching the match. Uh, it, it has been my thing always because like the guys I grew up watching were, you know, the Eddie Guerrero's, the Kurt Angles and all these other people like Dynamite Kids. And those are the people I really gravitated to. And I, I felt like <sighs> to drop another name, like the low key when I first tuned into TNA, man, oh, yeah. like, dude, like I know some and even Samoa Joe, but like you can watch wrestling and be like, man, that was great. But then you watch some guys, you're like, I don't know, that looked like it was real. And like, that's the thing that really pulled me in as a fan. So like, as a pro wrestler, that's the thing I always try to do. And I was lucky enough, early on in my career, I had a singles match and an Evolve show. It was like a really throwaway match. But on that show was Sammy Callahan against Fit Finley. And Fit Finley had watched my match. And I came to the back and I, I've been an enormous fan of Fit Finley forever. Once I discovered his stuff in World of Sport and everything else, it completely changed like my idea of what Fit Finley was because you know, I had seen him only with like Swoggle doing this stuff on SmackDown and he'd have awesome matches, but it was like a different thing. But like when I, I talked to him about it, he was just like, 
he told me about setting the hook and it's something he does all the time. He's just like, whatever the first shot you throw, you make that one mean everything. And I don't care if you hit the guy, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. You got to set that hook. Cause the second the fans see that they go, Oh my God, they're, they're beating the hell out of each other. And then after right. that, you can like kind of work it in. It's just little tricks like that. You pick up along the way. And like, I I'd never want anybody to question what I'm doing in the ring. Uh, I I've said it many times. I say it when I'm training people, I say it at seminars, I might not sell the tickets for the, you know, five to 15 year old kids that are coming to the show, but I will damn guarantee that the mom or the dad that buys the tickets that might not be as interested in wrestling, that is just bringing their kids will open their eyes and be like, damn, this guy's, this guy's legit. And I'll resell the tickets to those parents who like will bring their kids back in the future. Cause the, you know, that's my demo. Hide your wife. Josh Alexander's coming to town. I'm definitely, uh, I, I'm definitely well, he, not the know, sex appeal guy. Let's, <laughs> Well, he's got to stop bringing his family to the show if he, you know, if that's his angle. But anyway, you you just did a interview with Russell Zone talking about your, you know, kind of teasing what you have coming up for Hard to Kill Friday the Thirteenth Center Stage on pay per view. Wherever you get your pay per views, make sure you run over there and buy it because this is going to be one hell of a pay per view. I got you, Josh, on that one. Um, but. Uh, is this kind of because you you seem like a guy that it's going to be hard to evolve who Josh Alexander is? Do you evolve the Josh Alexander character through kind of ring gear like you've kind of just started doing? When did you kind of say, hey, changing up the ring gear might be a good idea because I geek out on that kind of stuff. So when you did the one a uh, few pay per views I think ago when you paid uh, homage to uh, past Impact guys, I loved it. Yeah, the Slammiversary gear where I made it the like Kurt Angle single with my own little twist with the Maple Leafs instead of the Stars. Yep. And I had the knee pad for AJ Styles and the knee pad for Samoa Joe because those three were my, like, those were my ride or die guys when I was a fan of Impact Wrestling. Those are the ones that really inspired me. So it was cool to tip my hat at that, especially at the 20 year anniversary for Impact. But uh, for me to evolve, like, my character and stuff, I think my look's pretty, you know, I'm pretty stuck in my look. I'm the the only guy that's pulled off headgear since Rick Rick Steiner, even though, you know, some people want to make fun of me for it from time to time, but whatever. Um, you know, th that's that. But like I, I I'm I'm just a big fan of ring gear and stuff like that. Like like I said, I brought up AJ Styles, man. You ever see that guy wear the same thing twice? <laughs> like and his stuff was always awesome. But uh yeah, I'll sprinkle stuff in here and there, especially for this full metal mayhem match. Like I told the Russell zone, you might see me draped in white as it's a good versus evil kind of thing going on. And uh, it was just my own personal idea. And he, you know, theorized that anytime you see white, you're going to see someone bleed. And, you know, I, I did comment that I bleed in every single match I'm in, regardless if there's tables, ladders, and chairs involved. So I'm sure this one will be no different, probably be much worse. So in podcasts, you bleed on every podcast you do. Get yeah where's the juice bro yeah. where's the juice well that's the tommy dreamer breath. thing <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> no he'll just break an arm trying to get a donut but um <laughs> oh. sorry sorry tommy i love you i'm just kidding um you know i guess i guess you know when i think about it you got bully ray who's an who's an who's an ex tna heavyweight champion right and now he's back you know when the idea came around to get you two together um, was it something that you were kind of like, ah, this could work or were you a little bit hesitant? No, no, I was, I was game for it from the very get go. Uh, you know, of course, like, you know, the way the internet is and stuff like that, you, you think you're just like, oh, this might not be well received, you know, but, uh, I think we've proven with the build to this match that, you know, Billy Ray, he can talk people into a building, you know, on a moment's notice. And as you know, is apparent by the show, it's sold out already center stage so um for me i was just chomping at the bit to get to work with somebody like bully ray because there's a lot i can learn from somebody yeah. like that that's been in the business for 30 years and it's stuff that you know i'm not going to learn maybe a lot like as far as like the execution of a wrestling match as much as i'll learn about the building a match and how to be a proper baby face and a proper heel and how to get people into the building and into the match the build to everything is i think the the thing that i can learn the most from bully from and you know i certainly have you know uh one thing impact does i think better than any company is reintegrating its past stars back into a company whenever they get them like a bully ray a christian cage guys like that you are you you've been fortunate enough now to be the centerpiece at at bringing in some of these guys are there 
past impact or TNA guys that you would, I mean, other than Petey Williams, of course, that you would love to face in this ring and maybe, I don't know if you call it TNA versus impact or, or, or whatever, however you would brand it, but you, you would kind of move up the legacy ladder with beating these guys. I think there's three names that are still active in pro wrestling that, you know, maybe it can materialize in the future. Uh, first one would be Christopher Daniels. You know, he's he's still active and working on the indies and AEW every once in a while. That would be awesome. I think the Fallen Angel is as synonymous with TNA and Impact history as anyone. Uh, Samoa Joe, second one. Also, you know, contract to talent AEW, but maybe, you know, never say never in this business. And uh, the biggest one of all, you know, unfortunately, he's injured with a broken ankle right now. But AJ Styles would be the uh, the the tippy top of my, uh, you know, requests. And honorable mention has to go to Jeff Jarrett, who I think at, you know, 55 years old, looks as good as ever from all the matches I've seen him have. And, uh, you know, those four would be at the top of my list. Where does Curry Man fit in there? <laughs> Uh, Curry Man and Suicide and all these other, you know, ones, they, they'd be cool, but uh, maybe just for TV, not for big pay-per-view. Well, matches. but Curry Man is Chris Daniels. Yeah, but, like, that's like saying that, you know, TJP is Suicide or, you know what I mean? Like, it's, or, you know, every other iteration of Suicide, Frankie Kazarian, John Grisham, Caleb Conley. <laughs> but, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. I, for me, like, the... The, the greatest match in impact history. And I think it'll never be surpassed. I've, I've died trying and I've had some matches that I think are the best I've ever had. And, you know, they might've gotten close, but they're not close enough is that three way Samoa Joe, AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels. So I'll be chasing that one forever, I think. And uh, you know, I I'll, I'll be fine if I never surpass it. Cause that's my favorite match of all time, but those, I, those three would, guys in that match. So I, I would love to see shark boy come back. I mean, I'm just, I'm just throwing in my two cents, but uh, he was back already last year. You should have bought a ticket and come man. Hell sh shell. Yeah. <laughs> shell. Yeah. Now, you know, it's funny because I remember when his action figure first came out and how hot it was, how everybody wanted that thing. And I went down to like, uh, 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 Walgreens, whatever, and I found like three of them. And I just remember being so stoked that I had three of these Shark Boy, uh, you know, figures that everybody wanted for a hundred bucks. And I was like, whatever. Anyways, my last question of the night, and I want to just say I really appreciate the fact that you took the time out, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you um, at the pay per view on the 13th. Um, you talked a lot about Japan, and you know, you you captured pretty much every title in Impact Wrestling. Uh, what if there was a, a a title in any Japan promotion? What what would be the one that you would really want to uh, to have? What what would that accomplish be? An accomplishment be? I mean, for my fandom, it, it's the GHC Heavyweight Championship or the IWGP you know Heavyweight Championship. Those two companies, I've I've watched. You know, both Noah and. Uh, uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling for the better part of 20 years now and been obsessed with everything they've ever done. And, you know, just coming off of, you know, those two giant shows on the third and the fourth year that I watched, you know, overnight and stuff like that, it just lit a fire into my ass to be like, man, I, I need to get over there because uh, not just the competition and stuff like that. Of course, I was lucky enough to get in the ring with Ishii already um, and Suzuki, but, uh, you know, it, it's that I think my style of wrestling would really, uh, you know, be successful over there. And I would certainly love to try it out and see if it is. I don't think you're wrong. I think you, you would fit very well. My last question to wrap up this podcast is depending on when people listen to this, you will be pushing 270 days ish as impact world champion. You have the longest reign in history. We've alluded to this many times. It's no secret. Has any of these guys that have been on this list reached out and congratulate you? Bobby Roode, AJ Styles, Sting. Well, I don't know if Sting even owns a computer in the Sting <laughs> cave, but, uh, you know, I, I know it's kind of a close family. Once you're TNA or Impact guy, you, you always kind of keep an eye on that brand. Have, has anybody reached out to congratulate you? Uh, I'm going to have to give the unfortunate answer of no. Nobody's, <laughs> nobody's reached out and congratulated me. Uh you know, maybe if I see them in person, they'll they'll have something to say. But uh, as far as like the DMs go on Twitter and stuff like that, I don't have any communication with any of those guys except for maybe Johnny Impact. And uh, no, I have not been congratulated. 
I know what you're saying. And yes, I will slide into your DMs and congratulate you. That's exactly what you're asking, right? <laughs> you, yeah, from one champion to another, it'll mean a lot. So. Thank you. Respect, Lars. <laughs> I mean, how many gold belts do you own that you've won? Well, you've won. Well, you know, well, I'll tell you what. I've got one there. Yeah. You know what I mean? But hey, it's real. It's not one, you know, it's a WWF one, not a WWE one. So that's the only, you know what? Fuck you, Dennis. All right. <laughs> Show me your platinum records. Oh. That's what I thought. That's what I, mean, I thought. That's we're all going to have to bow to this one now. So. <laughs> yeah. So am I. I mean, he does this every time, especially on the phone. I'll be like, hey, what do you want for lunch? He'll be like, show me your platinum records. I'm picking. <laughs> every time. It's Qdoba again, I guess. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, listen for everybody. Well, before we even get that, uh, one more time, hard to kill Friday the 13th, which I always love a good Friday pay per view. Uh, so the fact that this is on a Friday, I, I, I love anything different or an afternoon pay per view. Give me more afternoon pay per views, by the way. Can you? I know I've got Demore's number, I could probably just text him and tell him, but as champion, it might go a little bit uh, farther if you say, Hey, can we have an afternoon pay per view? for us please an afternoon pay-per-view i don't know i think we're going to stick to the friday night pay-per-views for a while right. now these have been pretty successful but uh I, like I, I do enjoy them as well so josh where can people find you uh instagram and twitter at walking underscore weapon and every thursday night on access tv in america or the fight network in canada on uh at 8 p.m for impact wrestling all right. Hey, listen, for everybody at home, the podcast's over. Turn it off. Go do whatever you do. We'll say our goodbyes off there. Lars Fredrickson, do you have anything going on? UK tour coming up. That's, I mean, that's, that's, you know, I just bought a new motorcycle. That's the only thing I really got going on. Oh, wait, t hang on. So, you know, uh, he's, he has a child coming. Now he buys a motorcycle. Oh, yeah. uh, well, don't say anything. Because, you know, I'm very superstitious. You don't say anything. Don't say anything. You millennials, you need to learn about superstitious, superstitions. Excuse me. It's, well, it's, congratulations on the uh, the upcoming child. In the yeah, well, thank you. Oh, well, you know what? The, uh, you know, it's going to be my, uh, it's going to be a girl. So I'm, I'm, I'm lucky and I'm ready. You know, I'm ready for a girl, I think. You know? I mean, I'm jealous because I only make boys, so... <laughs> Well, I, I got two boys already, and you know, there's a lot of testosterone in my house, along along with a lot of dirty underwear. So I'm ready for uh, something, you know, something different. Yeah, man, daddy's a little girl. That's that's what every dad wants. So, well, you know, the boys are gonna be gone. Be like, fuck you, dad. I know you're shitting yourself, but I'm fucking. I'm over here, and then the girl will probably be the one to take care of you. You know, Aww, man. that's but, so sweet. You know, uh, yes. Hopefully, Josh, when we come back and interview you again in the next year or two, it'll be 400 and something days as champion. Good luck at Hard to Kill Friday the 13th. We really appreciate you and Impact Wrestling allowing you to be here and talk to us. Yeah, I appreciate it coming on, man, anytime.